Okay, so now we're going to start with our program. This is where we have invited speakers to come and address us. These are mostly candidates for various offices. Some you may have heard before, some may be new to you tonight. Um, they have a time limit. They've all been given their time limit. And Monroe, please wave. All right, adjust your cap. There you go. He is our timekeeper. So if you are one of our featured speakers, please pay attention to Monroe's screen. He will give you a heads up when you're running out of time. And, uh, you know, we do have a time schedule to keep. So we might be nasty and turn your mic off if you get too long winded. So please do that. All right, and I think I saw our first speaker is on online here. If I saw right, I think I have Julie Gunnigal on. You sure do, Carol. Okay, all right. So our first speaker tonight is Julie Gunnigal. Uh, she is a candidate for Maricopa County Attorney. Now, this is an office that is not normally on your ballot this cycle. The reason Julie and this office is up is because the office holder who was elected to that position in the last cycle, unfortunately left office. And so that caused a resignation. And so Rachel Mitchell is the current office holder as an appointee. And because the way the system works in Arizona, that appointee can only hold that office until the next election which is, guess what, now. <laughs> so Julie has thrown her hat in the ring again. Um, if you don't know Julie, she is somebody who was born and raised in Maricopa County. She is a graduate of the University of Notre Dame Law School and served as assistant state attorney in Cook County, Illinois, where she prosecuted financial crime and political corruption. Again, she ran last uh, cycle in 2020 for this particular office, the attorney general or the county attorney. Uh, she lost by 1.5% folks. Um, so it does make a difference if you vote and if you don't vote because then people don't win. And Julie ran a wonderful race and came very close to helping that office and we wouldn't have gone through so much turmoil in those few years that leads up to this race if she would have won. So she's here tonight to discuss her campaign and what she's going to do to win this seat, which will be on the ballot in the general election. So Julie, it's all yours. You have 10 minutes. Watch Monroe. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, hey, thank you all so much for having me. Uh, for those who haven't met me yet, um, everything Carol said is true. I'm Julie Gonegal. I'm a wife. I'm a mom of three school-aged kids, all in our public schools, and I am a Notre Dame trained attorney on my 17th year of practice. It has been my honor throughout my career to be able to serve both the people of Illinois and Indiana, prosecuting, um, frankly, all sorts of crime, but specifically financial crime and public corruption, having worked for the professor who wrote the RICO statute who took down the mob. Um, my work on financial crime has been repeatedly cited to the Supreme Court once again this last week. Um, and that's why I jumped into this race last time. In 2020, I ran for this office because I was so frustrated with the corruption that I saw in Arizona. Having been born and raised here and then moved back to raise my family, just watching how we were funneling money into our private prisons instead of our public schools, how the... The uh, spirit of Joe Arpaio and discrimination was alive and well in our prosecutor's offices, watching how wealthy, powerful, well-connected, and police received special treatment in our criminal legal system, uh, I couldn't not get involved. And I was so grateful to have, uh, back in good old LD17's days, your, your help and support in, in 2020. I'm in this fight now for a very different reason. I'm in this fight now because of you. Because in the hours after the announcement of the county attorney's resignation from office, y'all blew up my phone. I literally couldn't place a call for over an hour. And it wasn't, you know, hey, are you thinking about this? It was, hey, we believe that we can do better, that we can have real justice in our county. We still believe in that bold vision of reform, do you? And you showed up for me in a completely unexpected way. Uh, everybody said that in the 13 days left to get candidate signatures that nobody could get 4,300 signatures. 
And y'all did it in 21 hours and set a new county record, the fastest a candidate has ever qualified for the ballot. And I'm so grateful that you did because there is no other group that I would rather be in this fight, in this moment with, because we can do amazing things if we can flip the county attorney seat for the first time in 42 years. As a reminder, this is the third largest prosecutor's office in our entire country. And we could be leaders when it comes to truth and justice and equity in our courts. And we're not. I wanna to talk to you just real briefly about the beautiful things that we could have in our state if we had a county attorney who was focused on reform and on justice, because that is my plan to get in there to fight corruption, to prioritize crimes that target women, children, and our seniors. And most importantly, I think in this moment, to protect, protect reproductive rights in light of Roe. So let me just tell you what the, what the plan is. Um, first, we have got to target corruption in our system. We need to ensure that we have a fully funded financial crime and public corruption division. We need to have an independent unit for police use of force because the Phoenix PD continues to be under a multi-million dollar investigation for colluding with the Maricopa County Prosecutor's Office. That is not okay. Uh, we need to be radical when it comes to data transparency. And I say that so that once I get into office um, come November, that not only do you hear me saying that I will never give sweetheart deals to Ducey appointees like Charles Ryan, but you'll be able to see the data and know that the, uh, the sentences, the chargings are all in line with nationwide best practices, which is something that no other prosecutor in our, in our state has done. I'm in this fight to ensure that we get her priorities straight. It's long past time that the county attorney uh, starts to focus on things that are actually re uh, that are actually public health crisis instead of alternatives to incarceration. Let me tell you exactly what I mean. We need to treat addiction, mental health, and gun violence as the public health crisis that they are and not an excuse to incarcerate people. Because I am sick of watching these cycles of crisis and crying and then vengeance and a move to do better, but no real action. And if we had a prosecutor that was focused on the root causes of harm in our community, we could actually see greater public safety at a much less public cost. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. Um, in our county right now, there are folks like Michael Calhoun. Michael Calhoun is one of the ACLU plaintiffs currently suing the office. Um, and he would tell you if you asked him that he is addicted and his rap sheet says the same charge after charge of low level possession charges, um, terms of incarceration. And when he got caught selling $20 worth of drugs, our county attorney said that he needed to be locked away for nine and a half years, that that was the best offer that he was going to get. Now, when I look at those issues, I know that nine and a half years translates to our taxpayers at a minimum of a quarter million dollars that we will be investing in someone like Michael Calhoun into a system that is not going to provide him with treatment, that is not going to provide him with support, and that is not going to make any of us safer when he leaves prison, as 98% of incarcerated people do. It's instances like that where we have the opportunity to really invest in treatment and to root causes that will make us all safe at a much lower cost. And last, but I think most importantly in this moment, I am in this race to make sure that this office stays out of your private lives and in particular out of your doctor's offices. In Arizona, we continue to have an over 100 year old law that makes a felony out of anyone who provides or procures an abortion with a mandatory minimum of two years and a max of five. We also have laws in the books that say that a fertilized egg has the same rights, privileges, and immunities as you or I, which sets up the very real possibility that in light of the fall of Roe v. Wade, that not only our providers, but our patients could be facing everything up to murder charges in our county with an overaggressive prosecutor who decides to use this as an excuse to invade our private lives. It is why when I was first asked this question on, I think it was the day that I qualified for the ballot, I was asked by Bram Resnick, will you prosecute those sorts of crimes? And the answer was a clear, not now, not ever. This is not a public safety priority to prosecute scared people who enter abortion clinics and their providers um, and spend your public health dollars in that way. These are also laws that have zero exemptions right now for instances of rape or incest. And I bring that up only so that you have the education to know that our current system, when I talk about prioritizing crimes that matter, crimes that target women, children, or seniors, that that is not happening now. 
Our sexual assault clearance rate in the city of Phoenix, for example, is less than 9%, which means that of all of the brave people who do report and many, and actually most don't, and say, this happened to me, I want to pursue this with law enforcement, in fewer than 9% of those cases, is there ever an arrest? And in fewer than 2% of those cases, is there ever a conviction? It sets up the very real possibility that in Maricopa County in 2022, that a person who is sexually assaulted and becomes pregnant from that assault would face criminal sanctions for obtaining an abortion, whereas her assailant likely would not. And I view that as the greatest justice issue that is on your ballot in this 2020 election. It is why I will always stand with pregnant people, with providers, and with reproductive justice causes. I am um, Planned Parenthood's very first endorsement of the 2020 cycle. And I think that this is the most important when we talk about uh, what we as organizers need to be thinking about in light of the fall of Roe v. Wade. Um, I will post my link in uh, in the chat, but I do want you to get involved with this campaign in, in this race. Um, my website is gunnigal2022.com. We are launching a massive volunteer drive. And in fact, I wanted to apologize for my appearance this evening as I am incredibly sunburned from an entire weekend of canvassing. I think I have time for maybe one question. I am just delighted to be here this evening. Thank you all so much. Thanks, Julie. Yes, we can take one question. If anybody has a question, please raise your hand or, you know, put it, put it in the chat. We'll be happy if you're not comfortable asking the question out loud. I'm happy to translate that. And I am not seeing any hands. Oh, Judy? Yes, I do have a question. Okay. Julie, I'm wondering if, because I have heard other candidates from other places make similar comments about not prosecuting women who do whatever is necessary to get an abortion. Would you face any sanctions for that stand? Not as of yet. So in Arizona law, we have one ambiguous statement that says the attorney general is the supervisor for our 15 county attorneys. That being said, it has never been the case that the attorney general gets to either step in, indict people, and if the county attorney doesn't um, chooses that the case is not in the interest of justice, or could come in and remove a county attorney. Now, that being said, we have a legislature that is absolutely unhinged and out of control, and what they would choose to, I see Representative Pollock nodding along, <laughs> What laws they could choose to put into place to make that a possibility um, is, is truly up to the most craven, depraved imagination. Um, but as of right now, um, no, there is, there is absolutely no check on a county attorney's use of individual discretion, which is what I propose using. Okay. And one other question is in the chat. How fast did it take you to get your signatures? How fast did it take y'all to sign that? that <laughs> it was 21 hours. And we got the final signature while I was live on the air with Chad and Gatos. Yep. So Who thank you the to Jesus out of those Republicans, y'all. They were they were absolutely frightened. It took the rest of their candidates the full uh, what was it rest of the week and one of them hundred thousand dollars to make the ballot. We spent one hundred and thirty nine dollars in union printing for yeah. our paper signatures. Yep. So thank you to everybody who quickly responded. You know, I think it's a testament, one, to Julie's capability as a candidate, but also thank you to everybody who responded because it's you who put her on the ballot. So thank you for doing that. Jennifer Germain. Yeah. Uh, Julie, could you quickly explain how um, the Arizona Constitution has a right to privacy and that could be used um, to help women going through um, needing an abortion? Absolutely. Um, and so this is the part where it's really important not just to elect me, but also to elect an attorney general who shares our values like Chris Mays, uh, because we do have an individualized right to privacy in our Arizona Constitution that is potentially more broad than our federal constitution. Uh, basic tenets of constitutional law is that your federal constitution is a floor, not a ceiling. States can always provide more rights, but they can never provide fewer rights than that. So an attorney general that interprets that, that provision more broadly, I think is absolutely essential because the courts aren't doing it. We have a 1970 case that basically said that the right to privacy in Arizona doesn't encompass abortion. Um, and to that end, having an attorney general who believes differently and is willing to look at it differently is absolutely crucial. Okay. Um, and I'm going to have one last uh, question here, and then we've got to move on. Uh, 
Dan uh, wrote in the chat, what about unalienated rights? If one right is removed, all rights are not longer protected by the Constitution? That is a question. Yeah, that is a question. Um, so <laughs> I'm sorry, here, a con law class in, in 30 seconds is um, our, our Bill of Rights originally, I, I believe, was intended to apply uh, to the states as well as to the federal government. There was substantial debate about it. The Supreme Court ended up deciding long, long ago that no, they have to be um, selectively incorporated based on how fundamental they are. Um, I think there is a very real concern as we start talking about issues within the 14th Amendment that we see erosions into the fifth. The, oh, we, we saw that we saw an erosion into Miranda just this term. Um, and yes, I, I share that concern. I think that the key is that Arizona, and if we pass fair elections, we'll continue to have a robust initiative and referendum process, and that amendments to our state constitution to provide, again, that, that more rights and not fewer um, is absolutely the way that we, that we get around what we will continue to see at the federal level, which is an erosion of rights writ large and remedies. Thanks, Julie, very much. And if anybody else has a question, maybe, I don't know, Julie, if you're going to be able to stick around, but you, Julie might be able to answer it in the chat. So with that, we're going to move on. Our next speaker, and I am not sure that I've seen her on the uh, Zoom meeting yet. I don't know. Is Yulenia Aguilera? Yulenia, are you there? Okay, she could be running late. She is a candidate for the Central Arizona Water Conservation District. Um, and if uh, she makes it later this evening, we'll get her on. So we'll go now to our hometown girl, which is our representative, Ms. Jennifer Pollack. Um, Jennifer is going to have 10 minutes to give us an update uh, on the legislative session that just concluded, as well as her campaign for re-election as the LD13 Arizona House Representative. So Jennifer, it's all yours. Thanks, Carol. It's nice to see you all here tonight. For those of you who are new, I did want to tell you who I am. Um, I was born and raised here in Arizona. And from the time I was six years old, I wanted nothing more than to be a teacher. And I was so lucky that I got to teach in Arizona for 17 years, kindergarten through sixth grade. Because I grew up here, I didn't know how crowded things were in our classrooms because that, those were the classrooms that I attended too. So about 2014, I, I really started realizing how tough things were here in Arizona. I had a friend who I taught with who moved to New York and she asked me if, she, if we wanted to be pen pals with our classes. And I said, oh, what a great idea. Well, she had 15 kids in her second grade and I had 32. So I had more kids than she and her neighboring teacher put together. So it was back in 2015 that I got involved with the local Democratic Party and I did training to learn how to be a candidate. And in 2016, it was the first time I ran. With your help, I was elected in 2018 and I was the first Democrat and the first woman ever elected to represent this district. So I was reelected in 2020 and now I'm going for my third reelection to the state house and now it's district 13. So I did want to start by saying thank you. Thank you so much for all of you who helped with the school supply drive. We've got all the backpacks loaded and I'm ready to send everything off to the city. If you are able to help at that event, it will be on Saturday the 16th at Chandler High School. And you'll wanna do a search for Four Hour City. And that's the organization that is doing the backpack drive. I also want to thank so many of you for volunteering to help with the campaign. We have people who take time to write out the postcards. We have people driving. We have people calling, working at the front desk, and every bit of it helps. So now I'm going to change channels here completely and talk about the budget. As we talked, gosh, I think about a month ago, maybe two months ago, there was a proposal back in April, and it was a skinny budget. And if you'll remember, that one died in the Appropriations Committee, and then we were all kind of sent back to the table. And as I talked about last month, we had a group of the conservatives within the Republican Party who said, 
there's no way I'm not voting for a huge budget. And there was one member of that group who even went so far as to say he was not going to vote for a 13 and a half million budget, which is kind of normal right now, that he wanted that cut down to $9 billion and all the rest given back to taxpayers. So because you need 31 votes to pass a budget in the House and you need 16 in the Senate, it gave the Democrats an opportunity for the first time in a very long time to negotiate, to get our priorities in the budget. And you heard Gary talk earlier about how we did get substantial funding in the budget for our education systems. So some of the, the things that I want to share with you is we ended up with $526 million added to the base, and that's per pupil funding. So yes, it did raise us up to 45 from where, whether we're 48, 49. It was a small increase, but that was a tremendous amount of money. We have not seen that kind of investment in a very, very long time, if ever. We also were able to get funding what we call the opportunity weight, and we're going to um, step into that and it's going to increase over the next couple of years. What that is, is additional funding to help children who are living in poverty because it costs more to educate them. We also got ongoing funding for special education, $100 million. Um, there was money for district additional assistance and charter additional assistance. And then there was $50 million for school safety. And initially when that one showed up in the budget um, spreadsheets, it was just for school resource officers. And a key point you need to know that we um, negotiated for was that we can all, the schools can also use it for mental health care providers. It's not just for SROs as it was originally. For higher education, we managed to get $12.5 million for the Promise Scholarships, and that's for kids, not kids, sorry, young adults who are living at the poverty level so that they can go to college. We got $100 million for university funding, $10.5 million for STEM, which is science technology um, Oh, with engineering and math at the community colleges. And that's a really big deal because if you'll remember back in 2015, the community college budget was cut $99 million and it was never restored. So that will be really helpful for our local community colleges and $7 million for rural community colleges. So some of the other areas where lots of funding went in, um, one was for kinship care. So if a child is in foster care and they go to a family that's not related to them, that family receives $300 a month to take care of the child. But if the child goes to a family member, say an aunt or a grandparent, the family member only receives $75 to care for the child. So we got that amount increased. So regardless if it's a family member or if it's a foster family, they all will receive $300 per child. We also were able to negotiate $60 million in the housing trust fund. They were hoping for $100 million, but it's a big deal to get $60 million into that fund. And then another huge celebration is $5 million to the arts in Arizona. Typically, every year they come and they ask for funding, and we usually... In a good year, they get a million dollars. So I wanted to share that all of that went in. We did have some, oh, and I'll, I'll share locally with the school districts here in Chandler, their share will be just shy of $25 million. And in Gilbert, their share will be, it will be $19.6 million. So it's a huge amount. I did want to also acknowledge that the ESA, which is the Empowerment Scholarship Accounts, or the, the vouchers as we commonly call them, those were universally expanded. That was a party line vote. And it's, it's incredibly disappointing. It, it's maddening because we worry like Gary spoke about that the funding for this program will go to people who already have their kids in those schools. I did want to also let you know that there were a couple of bills that we fought the entire session that didn't end up passing.
The first one was Senate Bill 1211, and that was the one that would require teachers to post every bit of their material online. It never went through the entire process. Thank you, Monroe. Um, the CRT bill that would do two things. Um, if someone was found in violation of that teaching critical race theory, teachers could lose their certificates and schools could be fined $5,000. That didn't end up making it through the process. Also, the um, bill that would allow out of state charters to take over schools with a D or an F rating didn't make it through the process. And none of the firearm bills made it through the process. So that was including loaded firearms on K-12 campuses and concealed carry on university campuses. So I'm almost out of time. So I wanna quickly tell you, we still need volunteers on the campaign. If you wanna do something easy, a super easy thing you can do is like and comment and share on social media posts. That's probably the easiest thing you can do. The next thing you can do that's super easy, you can write postcards. We leave them at the doors with people to give them information about voting and about the campaigns. If you'd like to do that, I'll put the address of the office in the chat and you can do that. We need people who can drive and keep their cars nice and cool as we are going door to door. We need people who would be willing to call voters and people who would be willing to please come knock on the doors with me. It, it really is fun. It's hot. It is hot, but it's fun. So I will stop there. And I don't know if there's any time left, but I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you tonight. Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> 30 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> All right. Uh, one quick, anybody have one quick question to keep us moving along for Jennifer? And I'm trying to watch the screens and see if I see any hands or. And right now I'm not seeing any, so I apologize if I'm overlooking anybody. But I think uh, you can always post your uh, comment in the chat for Jennifer, and I'm sure she'll get back to you and, and discuss with you. All right, thank you. Um, I don't see O.D. Harris on, so. We'll move along then to our next speakers, which uh, for everybody who is a longtime Democrat um, can think back on when we didn't have anybody running for an office with a D. And if we did have somebody running for an office with a D, you know, we were so grateful to have them stepping up to the plate. Our cup runneth over this time because now we have two candidates. We actually have a primary for the Senate seat here for the Democratic nomination for LD13 Senate. So you're going to hear from both candidates tonight, Cindy Hans and Michael uh, Morris. And this will be your last, probably last opportunity, although I do think that there is a, um, is it the clean elections that are going to be running um, some information next on the 13th, I think is what I saw, where uh, Cindy and Michael might be also uh, present on YouTube, I believe it's going to be done. But this will be your last opportunity to hear them before the primary. So we're going to, and like I said, in no particular order, I think Cindy went last time. So Michael, Michael Morris, if you're on, you have five minutes. So watch Monroe's screen. And this is your last time to give us a pitch. Okay, sounds good. Hi everyone. Um, you all know me. I'm on, I'm driving now, so I had to pull over to do this. So uh, it's not going to be as clear as usual, but I'll do the very best that I can. All right, here we go. So let me start by talking about women's rights. Women should have the freedom to make their own choices regarding their own medical decisions, including abortion. Those rights have been taken away by re Republican extremists, and we have to fight to get those rights back. Pro-choice voters need to register and vote. The only way to fix this situation is to elect leaders who actually represent the will of the people, not some small vocal minority. So please get out there and vote, everyone. Um, the next thing I want to discuss is record high gas prices. I strongly believe we need to eliminate the gas tax. Gas is a necessity just like food, which we don't tax. 
Arizona families are struggling right now and need some relief. I know what you're thinking. How do we pay for the roads and how do we replace the lost income for the state? Well, first of all, only around 30% of the costs to maintain the roads actually comes from the gas tax. We have federal funding and other sources that cover that. Secondly, we can easily replace that income by increasing the minimum corporate tax rate to more than just $50. That's right, it's only $50. Most Arizona corporations pay the minimum amount in income taxes thanks to J.D. Mesnard and others like him who sponsor and support legislation that hev heavily favors the wealthy. Next, I wanna address voting rights. So our voting rights are under attack and it needs to stop. It is literally undermining the whole democratic process by making it difficult for everyone to vote especially those of color and low income families. The result is we have an electorate that is not a true representation of the will of the voters. So let me um, take a step back here a little. So, you know, a society is judged in large part on how it treats its most vulnerable members. Children and the mentally ill are arguably the most vulnerable. However, our government our Arizona government is doing a disgraceful job in dealing with both. Let's start with public education. And by the way, thank you so much, Jennifer, for all the work, for all the work you do and all the great uh, strides that you made in this budget to get us more money for education. But, you know, what more can I say? We are at or near the bottom in virtually every category when it comes to public education, funding for pupil, classroom sizes, pay for teachers and so many other areas need to go on. It is the most basic and fundamental responsibility of the government to properly educate our children and they have failed miserably. There's simply no excuse for it. We need to replace these legislators with, with people, with legislators who have their priorities right, not all wrong, period. Um, public mental health funding, again, what can I say? We're also nearly last in the country in this critical area. We have one of the largest homeless encampments in the country, three blocks from our state capital, and our prisons are full of mentally ill people because the government refuses to allocate the resources to properly care for them. This is just not right. It's their responsibility. And, you know, I guess since there's no one advocating for them, like the wealthy donors whose interests are always protected, you know, they simply don't care. I'm here to tell you I care and I will advocate for them. Remember, if you vote for me, I will work for the people, I will do the right thing, and I will make a difference. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, is, does anyone have a question for Michael? We can take one to keep us on track. And again, either raise your hand or Put it in the chat. And I'm not seeing anything, Michael. So, so one last thing before I go. Um, my website is Michael Morris for azstatele.com and we added a volunteer page to that. So if anyone wants to volunteer, I would greatly appreciate it. Um, folks to knock doors, hand out literature, uh, to work on the phone bank, all that stuff would be greatly appreciated. Just go to the website, click on the volunteer page, and hit me up, and I'll get you all signed up. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. And drive safely, please. Thank you. All right. All right, so now we're going to hear from our other candidate in this race, and that's Cindy Hahn. So, Cindy, I'm going to let you take your five minutes, and Monroe will keep you honest. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Um, my name is Cindy Hans, and I'm going to go into a little bit more detail for the benefit of our new people. Uh, first, I am passionate about you all filling out your ballot and turning it in on time. I wanted to emphasize that I've spent nearly 30 years of energy in Arizona to make it better. I would like to represent you with that same energy and passion if I am elected to the Senate. As a teacher and a principal in a public school, I advocated for students and teachers all day, every day for nearly two decades, I helped solve problems um, in collaborative fashion and also for some quite diverse groups. Part of my work as an administrator meant that I had to run active shooter drills on my campus and drop detailed plans for what if. 
the July 4th celebration that um, it hit my heart because it was so brutal. We've got to get this weapons of war availability eliminated from our society. The shall not be infringed, infringed part of the second uh, amendment is not the holy grail and it cannot be. I would like to focus a little bit on the first three words which are of the second amendment, which are well regulated. I still advocate for students, teachers, and parents, as well as your property values as a volunteer for, for Save Our Schools fighting for funding. Well-funded schools are better for the economy and they result in safer communities because schools are in a unique position to identify and provide interventions for students who have physical, emotional, and mental challenges. <clears throat> However, we have to fund well enough to have lower class sizes and fund the peripheral staff to help those teachers like counselors and specialists of reading, speech, et cetera. As a poll worker and a deputy registrar and a member of the League of Women Voters, I've worked on the front lines of democracy for by ensuring secure and accessible elections, registering voters and providing unbiased voter education. If democracy is going to survive, people like me must ensure that the accessibility and security remain the hallmarks of our system. For years, I have been a reproductive health care advocate, volunteering as an escort at Planned Parenthood clinics. When Roe v. Wade was overturned, I grabbed my umbrella and rainbow vest to support the staff and patients in my local clinic for over an hour before leaving to canvas. I am fiercely protective of privacy. I want government out of my any meeting I have with my healthcare team. And I'm quite fierce about my unqualified belief in body autonomy. I've spent countless hours getting signatures for candidates and initiatives. Many of you know that I donate my time as a notary to bring these popular plans to the voters. I've done all of those things because of who I am. I love people, I love the state, um, and I love working with people and resolving issues. I listen to people and I try to come to some kind of resolution. Everybody has a story. Everybody deserves to be listened to. Everybody has questions. And when I work the polls, I'm so grateful for those people who are confused uh, because of the information that they hear and appreciate so much when they ask questions. You probably know I'm not all unicorns and rainbows. I believe that a radical minority is in striking distance of turning this country into an authoritarian and theocratic nightmare. That's why it is so critical to, um, I love Julie Gunnigal's passion and she is right on the money. In Arizona, in the last several years especially, we regularly- um, One minute. The governor and legislature pass all kinds of unpopular legislation. The only way to change that is to change the Senate representation. I believe uh, my values represent yours. I've been attending meetings with you for years. I'm going to put my contact information in the chat. Uh, so you can, I would like your vote in August, and I would love to oppose J.D. Mesnard in November so I can represent you in the Senate for the next two years. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sandy. Anybody have a question? To my watch. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody have a question for Cindy? We could take one question. Uh, raise your hand or put it in the chat. And I'm not seeing any raised hands. I could be blind, but and I'm not seeing anything in the chat. So anyway, oh, I'm sorry, Dan. See, there's my <laughs> there's my there's timer. <laughs> Dan, yeah, do you have a question? On the Second Amendment, um, yeah. as far as I can understood it, the Second Amendment gives people the right to create a militia as long as it's well regulated, meaning that it has to be sponsored by the government. It doesn't say anything about people owning private, private weapons, because if you look at the capitalization of it and the way that he uses the commas, the word arms is capitalized, just like state and militia, meaning that it's not talking about privately owned weapons. It's talking about military grade weapons within the contents of a militia. If you look at the uh, 
uh, the Lexington and Concord, the battle of those, the weapons that they that the British were trying to take away were not in people's individual homes. They were actually locked away in an arms uh, store. So uh, I just, uh, it's less of a question and more of a, I think that our candidates are, are, are facing it more because we keep talking about the second amendment, which is not what actually gives people the right to own guns. It's actually the fourth about you know the about people's property and liberty and that it is if you look at the constitution it talks about that the fact that congress has the right to control the militias it's got multiple points in it about the militias and the fact that the president is only commander in chief of the militias during a time of war and no other time it's specific about this uh so i just wanted to say that and think of have you ever thought about how the wording of it is to sort of use the idea of the originalist arguments mm -hmm. to sort of push back on them that says, look, you're wrong. The originalists weren't that way. Uh, it's absolutely right. You're absolutely right. The word it's, malicious, somebody, everybody forgets that. It, if you look at the Declaration of Independence and then you look at various documents within uh, English law, it's clear that the Second Amendment was all about making a posse basically to go and knock out the Whiskey Rebellion and Shaw Rebellion, you know, because it was a response to the Shaw Rebellion and was used in the Whiskey Rebellion with George Washington as basically commander of the militia. So I don't know. I think we need thank to. Uh, we're going to have to uh, move on, but yeah. thank you, Dan, for that comment. I'm sorry. We, <laughs> we're going to have to move on. But uh, all right. So thank you. And again, thank you, Cindy. An observation in the chat about that, a little bit about that. Um, entire books and libraries are devoted to what does the Second Amendment actually mean. Um, but I'll put it in the chat because I know you all have a meeting to go to. <laughs> Thank you for your time. I appreciate yeah. it. We have some other speakers to get to, but thank you both for your comments and thanks, Cindy, for presenting and for running for office. So again, people, uh, that is a contest that you will decide on uh, the primary election on 8-2. Now I've invited the three city council, Chan Chandler city council candidates who are running uh, tonight to speak one more time. I know many of you have heard from them before, but again, many people may not realize that their election really is the primary election on 8-2. If they get the 50% plus one, then they automatically go to council. If they don't, then there is a runoff. So with that in mind, I'm going to ask Angel Encinas to uh, speak right now. He's got a couple of minutes, and I think I saw where he was calling in by phone. So Angel, if you're available, please uh, go ahead and take your two minutes and make your last pitch. Hi, good evening, LD13, and thank you so much again for allowing me to come and speak with you guys. Normally, I'm on Zoom to see you guys, but I'm out canvassing and fixing signs at the moment, so doing double duty tonight. But I wanted to, again, remind you guys um, of the volunteer opportunities we have going on with Jane and Matt as well. Um, if you guys have any availability, we're mainly going out on the weekends with big groups um, to hit stores. Um, so if you guys are available, please lend us your time. Um, again, you can visit more information about my campaign at angelfordchandler.com. And as ballots are dropping this week, you know, I just ask you to please remind your friends and family to um, vote for, for us three this election. And yeah, and pretty much, yeah, just spread the word about um, getting people to vote and sending out the message. That's about it for me today. Okay, Angel, thank you very, very much and good luck. Um, our you. next speaker is also for the uh, Chandler City or Chamber or City Council. I'm sorry, Chandler City Council, and that's Jane Poston. So, Jane, I think you are on. So, take your two minutes and uh, give us your last pitch. 
well, everybody took all my stuff, so I'm going to be oh. able to keep it short. So thank you. <laughs> um, I am going to put my contact information in the chat. Um, I'm going to echo kind of what uh, both Carol and Angel had said. And, and I want to throw out a few numbers that I have learned. You know, not only is the primary really the election for us, um, you know, with about 80% of Chandler voters voting by mail, and those, you know, those dropped this week, of course. Um, I also understand that about 60% of those people that vote by mail vote in the next two weeks. So we're really at, at go time right now between now, uh, you know, tomorrow and the 15th of July, maybe a little pause before the polls open again on August. So I'm just going to echo what um, Angel had said. Please just remind people that, you know, this, this primary is truly where the council races are started. So um, we are kind of teaming up a little bit and we are tackling the city all across. Um, we're kind of working south. East Chandler right now. Um, we have a large canvas on um, Saturday where it's Angel's team, my team, Matt Orlando's team. Um, he's traveling tonight, so couldn't be here. Um, and then we have our firefighters walking with us as well. So we have plenty of packets for everybody. If there's anybody you could um, include, we'd really appreciate any help you could get. If nothing else, um, I'm going to echo too that a great way to help us, and I really appreciate what's been happening, is that liking and sharing our posts on social media. That really helps the algorithm, and the more we can get the word out, the better. So we really appreciate it, and thanks for letting us speak tonight. Thanks, Jane. Thank you very much, and thanks for coming by. And uh, I know Matt couldn't make it, so unfortunately we can't hear from him tonight, but uh, those are your council uh, candidates and please make sure people go all the way down the ballot. It is so crucial. Local representation is critical. You know, if you're a Chandler resident, you really wanna pay attention to who your governing board is. And those elections, like I said, are for you, not for the candidates, they're for you. They're running because they want to do things but without you, that can't happen. So please uh, do that. All right, now our final speaker that I have is Javier Ramos. Javier, are you still on the call? Yep, it looks like. Yeah. Can you unmute yourself? There you go. Hey, Carol, sorry about that. My wife, I just got home from a radio interview in Phoenix. <laughs> I sat down to eat some beans and rice with my family, so I just oh. ran over here. So, so sorry. Thank you. No, no, not a problem. Thank you so much, Carol and um, Legislative District 13 and Chandler. My name is Javier Ramos. I'm the presumptive Democratic nominee. My opponent is Andy Biggs, and I'm running for Congress. I really appreciate all of your support. I have a campaign manager, a political outreach coordinator, a volunteer coordinator. We have plenty of volunteers jumping on. What I've noticed out on the street is that people are calling me and apologizing for never voting before. People are livid, people are upset. Um, when Latinos were being caged up on the border, it was Democratic women who stood up for them. When the George Floyds of the world were being killed, Democratic women stood up for them. When women's rights are being taken away, we need to stand up together. Because if you don't think it's gonna affect you, it's gonna affect all of us when LGBTQ rights are taken away, voting rights are taken away, when all of these rights, social security is gonna be privatized, we need to stand up now. This has been going on for too long. We need to stand up vote our democratic principles. If we vote Democrat, we're gonna win this race. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you, thank you. It's the speaker portion of our meeting. Um, I will open it up to if there's any other business to be brought to the floor before we make a, an announcement for an adjournment. Is there anybody that has anything that needs to be discussed or any questions that are needing to be asked. And I am not seeing any. So with that, you know the important dates that are coming up. Look in your mailbox if you get a ballot by mail. They will start dropping tomorrow. 
Okay, it may take a few days for it to get to your um, inbox, but if you do not see them, I would say by the next 10 days or so, feel free to call the recorder's office and double check. You can also double check your registration on the recorder's office at um, Ballot Be Ready, I believe is one of the sites. You can also do that on Service Arizona. So you can do your own research, but if you don't see what you're looking for, then call the recorder's office. You have time to get a ballot yet by mail in case there's an issue. The primary is um, it's August 2nd. The polls are open from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, if you don't get your um, uh, ballot in the mail by the 26th, then please make sure that you drop it off at one of the voting centers so it gets counted. And again, encourage all of your friends and family to go all the way. Start at the bottom, go from the bottom up, to vote for offices. Each and every office is crucially important. But thank you very much. Oh, and just one thing next month, normally we would meet on the primary, which is um, August 2nd. We have moved that to the week following. So again, if you wish to attend the meeting, it will be, uh, put it on your calendar, the 9th of August at our normal time, 7 p.m. If we change location, we will also be trying to do it on Zoom, but I think we're going to try and do it in person if we can get the Wi-Fi situation worked out. So yeah. you're welcome to join us either in person or by Zoom, depending on the circumstance, and you will find that on the website. Again, ld13dems with an s.org slash calendar. Okay.